Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am your host tonight. I am Carice Laguerre. I am subbing in for the amazing Lauren. She is off tonight. We gave her a break every now and then. She deserves a break. But who is not off tonight is our special guest. Who we're talking to, Dr. Ben Moralia. He is going to be talking to us tonight about expansion with brackets and arch wire which is such an interesting topic. And I'm even excited to learn more because, you know, I, I thought braces were bad. <laughs> Not really, but you know, that is a common thing that is discussed within the industry. Can you do expansion with brackets and arch wire? So I'm really excited. I, I know you have some cases to show us. I'm excited to talk with you tonight. Yeah, looking forward to it. So we have Three cases to share, and and basically because we're we're in a, a smaller format, it's not really a full technique program. I'm going to share uh, three children that we were able to treat with um, uh, as and including in their treatment brackets and wires. So with expanders, brackets, wires, of course, phrenectomies and myofunctional therapy, as indicated, and we'll, you'll see as you know we show those cases, those three children had all of those things in common. But there's a significant section in there where the children do have brackets and wires in an expansive technique. And you'll, you'll see how things get kind of unraveled and continue growing in the right direction while we're using those. So they, they can be helpful. It just takes a nice technique. That is fantastic. So I know that there are going to be a lot of questions while you are presenting these cases. And I, we're so happy that you all are joining us tonight. If you have questions, feel free to place them in the chat. We will definitely save and reserve some time towards the end to answer all of the questions that do come through. But for now, let's give Dr. Ben the floor and let's learn. All right, thank you very much, Carice. I am going to share my screen. Let's see if I can do this successfully. Try, try this. Up. See how that goes. Did I get it? Let me see if I got the if I chose the right one. Yeah, there we go. So we've got some slides. Okay, so we'll we'll show this first one here. We meet this nine year old, and it's a referral from the pediatrician. And so. Um, what's what happened early on as we got started treating younger and younger and younger we um, went and met with some of our pediatricians so that we could sh you know, share with them what we were doing at a younger age so that they might recognize some of the kids who are struggling and maybe share them with us. So we would be able to offer our services. And again, with collaborative care, you know, our office, the myofunctional therapy team, the friend and revision team, whoever might be doing that. And then the pediatrician in some respects, you put it all together, you could really help out a child. So this is a child who was struggling and in pretty much every direction, and the pediatrician recognized that maybe we could help this child, so they sent her over to us. And you know what we're looking at here, of course, she's smiling, but very narrow. Uh, obviously, eight and nine are prominent, and you can see with the dry lips and the posture when she closes, there's probably a significant overjet because the lower lip kind of fits behind the upper front teeth. So we don't have lip seal at rest. We have someone here who's going to be mostly breathing through their mouth. And so predominantly mouth breathing usually comes with predominantly unhealthy. So we, we get to meet this child at age nine. And of course we have the profile photograph to show that yet the lower lip is posturing right behind the upper front teeth. So we're gonna find some overjet in this case. So we, from the photographs, we can kind of tell we're narrow, we're back, we're trapped. We've got this significant overjet. And then of course, you know, a, a terrible bite and some plaque, of course, we'll work on hygiene a little bit too. But this is what narrow and trapped looks like. And a mouth like this will come with a child attached to it that is struggling. So you can take a look at conversations with parents and figure out you know, what level of mouth breathing or snoring you might have. A lot of parents will be aware once we start educating them and then they start to pay attention to the kids they start recognizing that, oh yeah, we recognize that our child is mouth breathing most of the time, or we know that our child doesn't mouth breathe at all. And then they start to observe and they say, well, now that we started observing, we recognize there's a lot more mouth breathing than we thought going on. So this is a child that'll come with a narrow arch. And then when we start measuring, if we're at about 35 millimeters and we're heading towards 10 years old, and we're looking at this kind of you know, crowding and over jet, we know, you know, we're going to have a goal of a minimum of 40 millimeters to get to and grow above that. So 
we recognize when we take photos and measurements that the frenum might produce a restriction. So if we've got a restricted tongue, that'll contribute to the uh, lack of jaw growth and development as well. And we start to recognize we have more you know, underdeveloped jaws with tighter frenum. So part of the routine will be releasing that with, of course, myofunctional therapy. These just happen to be the printed models from scanning. And she comes with a 10 millimeter overjet. So we've got this 10 millimeter overjet to conquer. And, and you know, our goal is always to go wider and forward. So we're looking to make sure that everything we do is in a wider and forward direction. Someone who has a 10 millimeter overjet, we're looking for wider. And then if the maxilla is going forward a little, the mandible needs to go forward a lot. So it's wider and forward in both jaws. We try not to pull the upper jaw back to close the overjet. That doesn't usually help solve the symptoms. Then we get involved with our expansion. So we have expanders in the upper and lower arch because we need a good eight millimeters minimum in these children. So we're looking at expanders that are fixed. I like expanders that are fixed. We'll gain eight millimeters of width. And then now you're starting to see some of the brackets that are in there. And so when we do apply brackets and wires to start to perform you know, alignment and kind of shaping of the arch, once we've got the foundation, well, then our interest is that we would have a self-ligating bracket. And so you're, you're looking at carrier brackets. I'm a big fan of Dr. Lewis Carrier. And uh, him and his father you know, kind of invented these brackets and they've been around a long time. So I've been using them for, I think, 17 years maybe now. So these are self-ligating brackets. The arch wires are like a nitai type of wire. So kinetic or thermal nitai wires. So they're nice and gentle and easy on the teeth and the roots and the gum and the bone. Most of the kids we use these on, even if they're six or seven years old, don't feel much. They're very comfortable to use. So gentle light force. And then with the self ligating and those, that combination of those wires, you can get some really nice shaping in the arch. And basically with the arch wire being very broad or a wide arch wire, we're really, I'm looking, I like the biggest arch wire I can get. And so they make, whether you call them DLX or LX or extra large or wide, or you know wherever you're getting your wires from, they probably have a line of wires that is in the broad arch or widest arch category. So I usually go for the biggest arch wires I can get, especially when we're looking to give the child like eight millimeters of expansion before we do anything. But what happens is we get into the expanders and you know within a few months time, we can have our eight millimeters wide. We can add some brackets and wires and shape the arch nicely. But with the eight millimeters of expansion and then a little bit of arch wire shaping, usually what'll happen is that maxillary development will free the mandible. And so, uh, we talk a lot about a mandible being trapped behind a very narrow, underdeveloped maxilla. So when we meet the kids who are narrow and they show up with you know, tremendous overjet, a significant amount of expansion usually resolves most, if not all, of the overjet during the expansion. So here we're looking at you know, what could be about 10 to 12 months into treatment, where we go from that narrow, significant overjet to uh, a broad, wide arch. We're done with the expanders. We're done with the brackets and wires. We remove everything because what we'd really like to do is get involved with the myofunctional therapy and get the frenum released and again, work the myofunctional therapy for a good six to 10 month run. While we're doing that, we deliver guidance appliances. So, you know, different companies make different guides uh, and they, they'll all work for you. Just whichever one you choose to work with, just get really good at it and comfortable with all their techniques and you'll, you can do a wonderful job. So when we remove expanders and brackets and wires, we're looking to switch into a guidance appliance because whenever a child is wearing a guidance appliance and they're 10, because this is a 10 and a half year old at this point, we still have to grow more. We're not done growing at 10 years old. So we want an appliance in there that isn't, let's say a fixed retainer or a retainer of sorts, because we're not trying to retain the child at 10 and a half, even though we made a nice improvement and we have some gains here. We're not trying to hold them here. The, the idea is now we just want to recruit the breathing and the musculature to keep the child growing in the right direction, which is wider and forward. So a guidance appliance is nice because they're removable. Most guidance appliances are not about the teeth. They're about the breathing and musculature. So it's foundational uh, as, as a base. And then we can get involved with the frenum revision and the myofunctional therapy to recruit the breathing and the musculature to grow the child accordingly. And then over time, <clears throat> basically what happens over time is 
you deliver the tongue into the roof of the mouth and let it continue shaping and moving things along as the child is losing the rest of the primary teeth. As we lose the rest of the primary teeth and things start to kind of land where they belong, <clears throat> you can keep doing the myofunctional therapy with the guidance appliances. We sprinkle a little bit of nasal hygiene in there. We do like the children to use sprays and blows their nose and keep everything clean. If you have good nasal breathing and you have proper muscle function and balance, you really should see the teeth kind of come together and, and gradually lock into a beautiful place. So to get ourselves from here to here, we get involved with the fixed expanders to get at least eight millimeters wider. But once we get that nice expansion going, it's nice to add in the brackets and the wires to shape the arch. And then of course we can remove the expanders, finish a little shaping with the brackets and wires, and then remove the braces to switch into our guidance appliances for the myofunctional therapy component. But all of this amount of progress is accomplished by the fixed expanders, and those, they usually last about six months of time. The brackets and wires usually jump in halfway through expansion, so three months into treatment, and then we might use those for like 10 months. Somewhere between 12 and 15 months of total time, the brackets and wires are gone, and then we can focus our attention to the frenum releases as well as the myofunctional therapy and the use of a guidance appliance until the rest of the permanent teeth erupt into place. And basically, we get to a point where the 10 millimeter overjet is gone, but not by anterior retraction, but by you know wider and forward growth of both jaws. And most of that is seen in, in the face photos where we have you know really nice proportions. Instead of the face being long and thin, it's starting to round out. So now the face becomes shorter and rounder as we're developing the width and coming forward. And then of course, we start to see the difference in the profile in that but we do have the lips developing forward, the upper and lower lip, we do have a full chin and jawline, and now we don't have the deep bite anymore, so the lower lip isn't folded over or in, and so that child who's kind of migrating or growing wider and forward is able to now nose breathe, and so to go through the sequence of events where you can become a nose breather and then have your, you know, muscles completely balanced, you'll be sleeping better and then thriving. So a child goes from struggling in pretty much every category, whether it's home or school, to completely thriving where now there are no more challenges, so to speak, at home with behavior and or at school with the behavior or the academics. That child has come far enough using the guidance appliances with the myofunctional therapy that um, it's unlikely that you even need round two at age 12 or 13, but you can keep using the therapy and the guides until that point. And then if you turn 13 and you figure that, well, you need a little bit of alignment, you can always make a few aligners for these kids. And we'll show that in the next case that the patient goes a little bit older. So this is another nine-year-old that we meet who is struggling and very unhealthy. And we're going to learn about how unhealthy in a second, but similar where narrow, retracted or retruded jaws. You don't have lip seal at rest, dry lips. We know we've got mouth breathing going on. Of course, usually mouth breathing comes with a list of symptoms. So this child wakes up every night, has difficulty sleeping through the night, struggles with bedwetting, has night sweats, has night terrors, snores, there's mouth breathing and snoring going on as we ask the parents, you know, the, the child, when they met with the myofunctional therapist and they did a bunch of recordings of things like reading, um, one of the things the myofunctional therapy will do is ha have a child read through the alphabet or say the alphabet, and then it, you, know, you can see how the muscles are being used to do it. He has trouble saying the alphabet through, which meant that in, in like 10 attempts, he would make at least two errors every time he repeated the alphabet. And what we come to learn is that he had repeated third grade. We've done third grade twice and struggled through fourth by the time we meet him. So we have a lot of academic struggles. And then we also came to learn that he, he was post phase one orthodontic. So at nine years old coming to see us, he had already been with a specialist for over a year. So, I mean, that we have to put that into perspective because the photograph we're looking at here is post phase one orthodontics, just in a different technique. And so we'll get to see like where he landed based on someone else's phase one orthodontics versus where he lands with our phase one so-called orthodontics, which it's not even a good word orthodontics, it's more orthopedics. But <clears throat> we've got a profile that's deficient. So the, you know, the eyes and the lips are lined up. And when your eyes and lips are lined up, that's a place where usually you're retruded. And when you're retruded, you usually have some sort of you know, narrow or compromised airway. And so 
you know, this profile view is again, part of the records that we take meeting this child at nine, but this is also a, what would be considered post phase one ortho since someone already worked on them for a year and a half and landed here. There's a significant overjet. We don't have lip seal. And now we can see the tube in here, you know, following the nostril to the airway. By the time we get to the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx, these are all small. So basically he's trying to breathe through a coffee straw, which delivers those symptoms that turn into a really unhealthy and struggling child. So the anterior view shows that kind of what we're, we're gonna know is a narrow V-shaped arch. And then with that narrow V-shaped arch usually comes that trapped mandible. And here again is another eight millimeter overjet or 10 millimeter, whatever it might be, but a significant overjet. So we have this V-shaped arch, which is not a natural arch form. You know, we're supposed to be a broad wide dome. We're supposed to be a shallow vault, not a high vault. And, and basically this is not the look of someone who can breathe well through their nose. And then we have this in here, which, you know, we, we use the words lingual control arch, but those of you who have heard me give my opinion on this, I call it a jaw binding appliance because it kind of locks things in place where the child doesn't belong. You know, the, the camouflage routine of removing the lower primary canines to line up the four incisors doesn't really help the jaw growth and development. And then the bar that's put in there is pretty rigid. It kind of holds the child where they are. So, you know, in my world, this is like wearing the same size shoe for years and years and years, expecting it to be a good outcome. That's not going to go well. Here we are kind of freezing the distance between these teeth and locking this into a place where the nine-year-old first of all, is underdeveloped, they don't belong here. And any little bit they could get in the growth and development category will be impeded by something like that. And we have no room for the canines and premolars to fit into this arch. So it should be no surprise at that point, we learn or they end up as a consult in our office because they were told that they'll have to have the four bicuspids out in the future. So they were told we gotta take out the top ones to fix the overjet or correct the bite and the bottom ones don't fit. So we have to take out four teeth. And then, of course, they end up in our office to talk about our opportunities. Well, of course, we're going to include the myofunctional therapy. We're going to have to get involved with expanders, but we need some brackets and wires in here. We're going to show you, again, those self-ligating brackets. We're just going to use them with a significant amount of springs to help to grow the arch right after the expansion is done with myofunctional therapy and a guidance appliance as well after the expanders and brackets. We'll get to a point where we could do phase two with maybe clear liners. So we get involved with expanders because the child needs at least eight millimeters. You know, we don't put expanders in children to do less than eight millimeters of expansion. So expansion in our world begins at eight millimeters in both arches and above. And so, you know, this is a case where eight to 10 millimeters would be indicated like the previous child, upper and lower expanders to widen the jaws completely. The overjet starts to disappear when you deliver that much maxillary growth. The self-ligating brackets are wonderful. They're gentle, they're easy. You can work your way around the arch. You can put them on permanent teeth. You can put them on baby teeth, anything you need to align. Then of course we start seeing springs too. We use a lot of springs with our broad arch wires and our self-ligating brackets. So with a beautiful bracket and wire and spring technique, all of a sudden you can develop the arches to give yourself the room for all of the teeth. So now you can see what it looks like when we take the expanders out. So the expanders have been recently removed like minutes ago in this picture because you can see the outline of where it was kind of there and uh, tough to clean under. But once we have the width developed and we have the arch wires in there, the arch wires, since they're you know really big and broad, they kind of spread things out. You can see the brackets on the primary teeth wherever you could. And the next thing you know, you have teeth coming into spaces that are available for them as opposed to being trapped. So we go from expansion with our fixed expanders to the self-ligating brackets, wires, and sometimes springs, and we start to open up the arch. Now, what we're looking at here is a 10-month change. So in 10 months' time, we put expanders in. About three months in, we added the brackets and wires to shape the arches. And then by 10 months, we want to take everything out of there because we want all of it out of there. Now that we've got a big and appropriately shaped foundation and teeth kind of lined up where they belong, we want to switch over to frenum revisions, biofunctional therapy, and guidance appliances so that now we can get our breathing and our musculature to do the rest of the growth and development for this child. And friend and releases, myofunctional therapy and guidance appliances all help to get to the point where we get, you know, good nasal breathing and proper muscle function and balance to continue the process of the growth and development 
while the child is supposed to be growing and developing, because here we're only about 10 and a half years old. So the difference between struggling and thriving is that on the left side of the screen, we've got a child who predominantly mouth breathes and has trouble sleeping through the night and wakes most of those nights, and then has a long list of symptoms that comes with that. On the right side, in 10 months time, we have a child who can breathe through their nose, will sleep through the night, and have a decrease in the symptoms that they had. Of course, with developing the arch width comes developing forward movement. And so we start getting, you know, the jaws growing forward as well. So with wider and forward growth, we start to get an increase in the airway or space for the air to flow, which is a difference that we can see here in just 10 months. So in 10 months time, we've done a lot of significant expansion and shaping of the arch and now the tube is bigger. So we could recognize that we've got a little more space developing in here and we're only 10 months into treatment, but here we have a significant amount of movement wider and forward delivers more room for the air to flow and with better airflow comes better sleeping and breathing and that produces a significant change in his first 10 months so from waking every night he ends up you know stopping that at about eight weeks two months into treatment with the amount of expansion we were able to deliver all of a sudden he can breathe through his nose fully and sleep through the night the bed wetting which was anywhere from you know five to seven nights a week by the eight week mark was completely finished so two months into treatment what was you know, a seven year run of, of bedwetting was now uh, done. The night sweats turn into none. There's no more night sweating. And the night terrors turn into dreams. Most of the kids that we're treating, if they have nightmare or night terror in their symptom list, they will tell you about dreaming because they've never dreamed before. And they don't remember having dreams. And all of a sudden when they start dreaming, they'll tell you I have dreams now, I don't have nightmares anymore. And they're happy to talk about the dreams they're having instead of their nightmares that creates a whole different child in and of itself. The, what used to be a lot of snoring and mouth breathing is now silent nose breathing as reported by the parents. What used to be a child who struggled to say the alphabet had done third grade twice, was struggling in fourth grade, and can now read you know, the Harry Potter series. It's him and his mom do that every night before bed. They read chapters of the Harry Potter series. So he's now reading that out loud where before he was struggling with the alphabet. Within 10 months, we have the expanders out, we have the practice and wires out, we have switched over to our focus being on myofunctional therapy, of course, the frenum revisions as indicated and the guidance appliances to maintain nasal breathing and proper muscle balance and function so he could continue growing on his own. So we don't use any type of fixed, expand, uh, fixed um, retainer type appliances because even though we've delivered a better position for the child, that's still not where they belong, they have to keep growing. So from nine to 10, if we treated them, you know, by the time we get to 15 months, we want to make sure that the breathing and musculature continues the pattern. So we don't fix anything in there as a retainer, we let it grow itself. So now here we have the broad wide arch developing for the upper and then the lower. And this is all within about 15 months of time. We went from a child who was being told that, well, you're going to take out the four bicuspids as your part two. They come and get another opinion. And within 15 months, we have a mild amount of crowning with 14 teeth in the arch present. And what we're looking at now is something that pretty much everybody knows you could do that with just a few clear aligners and resolve that, which is about to happen in a moment. So we get to clear aligners when he turns into a teenager. And there are some of the attachments to show for it. So you have a few attachments in that arch. You go through a few. We made him 17 aligners. So he wore 17 aligners, which is about eight months of time just to shape the arch. And in shaping the arch and having, you know, beautiful occlusion, you can have a wonderful smile, which you'll see in a minute. But the idea here is the, similar to the previous case where we had a significant overjet, doing all of the expansion early delivers the freedom and the permission, so to speak, for the mandible to come forward and grow forward with the myofunctional therapy and front releases. Neither one of these two children had any type of elastics used. We don't use the class two elastics to try to pull something forward because pulling something forward is also pulling something backward. And so rather than pulling the top back to try to close some of this, we look for growth and development forward. We just need more out of the lower. So we really rely on the uh, level of expansion. We want significant. We want the broad arch wires giving good shape to the arch. And then we want that frenum release, myofunctional therapy and guidance appliance to take over and get the tongue to do the growth and development for us so we can have the complete elimination of any horrific overjet without the use of elastics or, or anything other than the natural musculature of, of our, our tongue doing the work. So basically we get to a point where all of a sudden 
he's a teenager and he's got a little hairstyle going there and he found the axe cologne. So he puts on extra of that. And you have someone who's got a, a full broad smile wearing a few aligners to kind of finish shaping the teeth and is a nasal breather and is thriving in every direction. So in 2021, he turned uh, 17 and you could see here at age 17, the wisdom teeth are erupting and they're, they're erupting in line and in function without any discomfort. So he now has um, his 28 teeth turned into 32 and now he'll have 32 teeth in function in class one with a beautiful home for the tongue. And at this point in time, he's, you know, varsity soccer player, varsity basketball player, drummer in the band in school, straight A student, and has, you know, all kinds of good things coming his way. Thanks to, you know, being able to breathe and sleep well through the night. All of a sudden you're a different human being. You're no longer struggling in school. So all the way to age 17 in 2021, where you have a beautiful bite, without any type of fixed retainer. He basically wears a clear aligner to bed every night. It maintains a beautiful shape in the teeth and the position. He has a class one canine through molar. So we can always you know, show you the sides of the pictures here just to tell you you got your class one. But in the end, you've got a, a big, broad, full smile on a child who is nose breathing, sleeping through the night and thriving in every category of life you could think of without anything unhealthy. Most of his unhealthy disappeared within eight weeks of expanding that maxilla and mandible. So another child, but a little older, 16. We meet some kids who are older and all of a sudden they're 16 years old. And the only reason this child wasn't treated was that the mom had refused to take out teeth. And so um, everywhere they went, it was multiple places. Mom brought the child and they said, you have to take out teeth. You have to take out teeth. You have to take out teeth. So they kept looking and uh, sure enough, the years went by and the, the child never got treated because the mom refused to take out teeth. She was looking to find someone who wouldn't take out the teeth. Well, she stumbled upon our office by accident. So the child, she chipped her front teeth and ended up coming in to see my partner to get her teeth fixed. And so he did some bonding there and said, you know, um, the bite, the teeth, you should talk to Dr. Morelli because he treats a lot of the kids, you know, with you know, the orthodontics. So you, got, you should talk to him. Like, okay, well, let's talk to him and see what he has to say. Because they've already heard from everybody else that you have to take out teeth and the poor child hasn't been treated. So here she is at about 16 years old and, you know, narrow, collapsed, of course. You'll, you'll, you'll see it in a second how crowded things are. So we have that narrow, collapsed, crowded, deep bite. And again, probably the 10 millimeter overjet. Oh, it's 11. It's 11 millimeter overjet sitting in there and then here you go. Here's the upper arch. So there's a little bit of crowding. So these are all the permanent teeth are represented there. There are 14 teeth there. It just so happens that, you know, number four is sitting inside there. This is very narrow. This is 25 millimeters as a transverse measurement. You know, those of you who have heard me talk about transverse measurement and refer to Dr. Bogue's research and Dr. McNamara's research, you know, Dr. Bogue taught us about transverse measurement in children. And a four-year-old should be 30 millimeters, you know, at age four. And here we have a 25-year-old, um, sorry, a 16-year-old who's 25 millimeters. And so that's a really bad number, 25. There's no room for the tongue whatsoever. So you could imagine there would be, you know, a list of symptoms that come along with this. And of course, the bottom is, you know, equally as crowded and collapsed, and the tongue has absolutely no room. So you're looking at, you know, the premolar number 20 is snuck into the lingual and then on the right side, it's even worse. That is the canine. That little tip of tooth in there is tooth number 27. So you can see 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. There's 27 and 28 are kind of stacked back to back. And, you know, we, we don't take any teeth out. You know, we're doing this 18 years now. We have yet to extract a tooth. We will never extract a tooth. Not only don't we extract teeth, most of the kids we treat have their wisdom teeth come in and function for them. So we're, we're, we work off of the idea that we want 32 teeth as a finished Results. So why would we do it any differently here? We'll just work on the foundation first, grow the foundation, and we'll incorporate some of the same things. And yes, there'll be some brackets and wires used to help develop this jaw as well. So you can see from this photograph, that poor tongue has nowhere to go. These teeth are completely trapped in there. So here is someone who at minimum would have sleep disorder breathing going on. And at maximum, maybe their OSA, we didn't bother with the sleep study. We're not treating the sleep. I'm treating the jaw growth and development, which is deficient. So We'll treat the underdeveloped malocclusion in the same fashion that we, we treat it, where we're going to grow the foundation first, and then we're going to focus on the teeth second. So foundation first, teeth second can go a long way. Of course, the, the frenum will be there for you to release because 
the moment you start to do uh, protocols that kind of quantify the frenum, you start recognizing that more than half of the kids have tight frenum, which also contributes to the lack of jaw growth and development. I like Dr. Irene Marquezon. So Dr. Irene Marquezon, the Marquezon protocol is a scoring system from zero to eight. This child scores a five and a three on her, on her scale is, uh, makes a recommendation for revision. So only a zero, one, or two is a, a, a loose type of frenum where the tongue has good mobility. Once you score a three or more, you're in the should be released kind of category because then the tongue is trapped and doesn't have a way to help you grow the jaws. So she's gonna be in line for some frenum revision with myofunctional therapy, of course. So it's tight, it's tied to the alveolus there. And if, you, if we could release that and work, you know, get the tongue working for us, it could help us a lot too. 25 millimeters is pretty narrow. So it begins with expanders. And I do get all of my expanders from Ollendorf Appliance uh, Laboratory. They're in St. Louis, uh, Evan Ollendorf. Uh, it's third generation running that place and they do a beautiful job. So you're looking at his expanders. He made these for me. And yep, they fit right in there. We had to be creative with the blue spacers and work it out to kind of sneak this in. Uh, this is a small one. So we had to sneak this in. And of course, it's going to be two rounds of expansion. So we need two rounds of expansion to get you know, ourselves up to about 40 millimeters before we could have all of these teeth take their position in the arch. So basically, expander progress, you know, as the top works its way open, you get a separation of, of eight and nine. So you get your sutural growth happening. And next thing you know, we're working our way wider, wider, wider. And eventually, we'll have to go through two rounds. You know, here, here's the first one exhausted. So we have about six millimeters here. And that the smaller expander is only about an eight millimeter expander. So you get to six or seven, and it's time to move on to a second set. So once you get through the first set, you go through the second set. So swap out this one for the next one. And then as, we're, as we get all the expansion done, then we're looking at, you know, a 16 year old is, is 17 or coming up on 17. And, you know, we met her as, as a junior in high school. She was just starting junior year. And so no one else had braces on. So we were talking to her about, oh my goodness, you know, we're meeting you now. We're going to be involved with some packets and wires in here. So she, you know, brought up about senior, uh, junior year, the prom, and then there's senior pictures and all these things coming up and she didn't want to have braces on for those. So we talked about, okay, well, if we can get you through the expanders, which nobody really sees from the front view, like when we were looking at this picture, you know, expanders are kind of hidden aside for the little gap, but as we do this slowly, you don't really see the expanders much, but when you get to this point here, we talked about, okay, look, we've gone through two rounds of expansion in a 16 going on 17 year old where it's a slow expansion because they're a little bit older. And now we're talking about 10 months into treatment. We're, you know, we're coming up on junior prom. So we agree, well, let's get your top teeth into clear aligners and we'll get your lower because of that canine, the other premolar. I need a little more help down there. I can put the lower braces on for a while. And so we added the lower brackets and wires. We added the upper aligners to her. And she was totally fine with this because now we can make for nice, you know, prom pictures and finish up junior year, get into senior year, spring senior year photographs and then senior prom. But the idea is, again, the self-ligating brackets, the, uh, the kinetic or thermal arch wires and springs. And when you do your two rounds of expansion first then jump into big broad arch wires with self-ligation and springs, it's gentle, it's kind, it's easy. And you can do a lot of beautiful development with those. Gradually, the springs start opening little spaces. You can see here spread out throughout the arch. The upper arch is now in clear aligners, and the attachments are pretty good evidence of that. But the upper arch is moving along with the clear aligners while the lower arch is gaining more room. That would have been way too much for the clear aligners to handle. So rather than attempt that to come up short, we got in the lower brackets and wires to use like, through junior year and into the senior year kind of thing. And gradually, <clears throat> we looked at something like this where we were coming up on her, it's like senior graduation day kind of thing. So we get to the point where we have almost the entire arch developed, two rounds of expansion. Uh, the upper arch went into clear aligners to get you know this far along and then a little fine tuning. The lower arch went through two rounds of expansion. And then of course the self-ligating brackets uh, with a lot of springs to get all of the teeth into place. Then we switched into clear aligners. And so now we've got upper and lower clear aligners being used to do some fine tuning. So we have a full growth of the foundation. The frenums have been released. The myofunctional therapies uh, mostly finished at this point. 
and we're doing some kind of tidying up with some clear aligners just to get to the, the end of everything. But she has the first 28 teeth in there, and lo and behold, you know, it'll be a matter of time, but the wisdom teeth will have room to erupt also because we deliver, you know, a nice foundation to accommodate those as well. So all three of those cases have, you know, similarities in that, you know, they, they all get fixed expanders. We always use upper and lower fixed expansion because we always use a, um, an amount of expansion that is significant enough to grow the jaws enough to accommodate the wisdom teeth. And so basically we're, we're looking at upper and lower fixed expanders. And in some cases like that third one, two rounds of it so that we can get the full amount of jaw growth and development. Those children then get involved with self ligating brackets, which are beautiful for nice, simple sliding around the arch wires, broad arch wires and springs when necessary to continue the pattern of outward growth uh, so we can use braces successfully as long as the arch wires are big and, and broad and also we have self ligating technique is very nice. Then of course, we like to switch those kids into either guidance appliances if they're younger or clear aligners if they're a little bit older to do the fine tuning, which is also nice and gentle and easy. Probably the most important part of everything is that the frenum revisions are done as needed and the myofunctional therapy is done as needed and all three of these kids go through you know frenum release and myofunctional therapy accordingly because when you're including the nose breathing and the muscle activity you're recruiting those things to help you go where you need to be as opposed to fighting against them because if you leave the dysfunctional muscles behind then you compound the difficulty that you have trying to do orthopedics and orthodontics because you have to now account for all of that you're fighting against so it's one thing to have the all of the tongue and facial muscles working with you because then things go better your way versus against you, which means you got to ratchet up all your force and power and hope that your rubber bands and your stuff can outbeat the tongue or the lips or the cheeks. And in a lot of cases, they don't. You know, these three cases are examples of having eight to 11 millimeters of overjet all corrected to class ones without a single elastic. No elastics are used. We don't have to pull anything forward or backward if you just go ahead and use nice techniques and recruit the muscles as well. So we generally, we talk about loosely, I have talked about brackets and wires being bad. And, you know, when I say that, I usually mean alone, meaning if a child is 12 to 15 and we're going to use braces alone, I'm not a big fan of that because then typically you can't really get great foundational growth and development. The, the place for brackets and wires in our world is after expansion uh, is done in both arches. And, and as then part of the treatment plan is the friend and releases with myofunctional therapy. So if you have wonderful expansive techniques using upper and lower expanders, and you have friend and release with myofunctional therapy as bookends, you can insert brackets and wires and do wonderful things similar to what you saw here. And of course, this isn't the technique course, you know, we spent a day teaching how to do all this but it's just an exposure to what is available to children pretty much of, of any age and you know, sprinkle in a 16 going on 17 year old where you could do wonderful things with fixed expanders and brackets and wires and develop an arch that everyone up to that point of age 16, and I don't remember how many consultations they went on, but everyone to that point said, you have to take out the four bicuspids to treat this case. And we're gonna have that child have 32 teeth. As soon as they erupt, we'll just update our photos and show you someone with 32 teeth one day. That'll be really nice to show that. So that's that's all I have for now, but we have some questions to talk about, I guess. Absolutely, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And there is so much information there. Uh, well, there are you. a lot of questions. So just right. to start, um, I think they would like a little bit of clarity about the guidance appliance. Is there a particular one that you use, a particular brand or any guidance appliance? I know that any of them will work and I have used all of them over the years. So right now I'm down to like two that I prefer. I, I use a lot of Myobrace appliances and I use a lot of the Vivos appliances for kids. But any one that you are currently using, if you know how to use it really well and you incorporate all of the rest of it, you should be able to have wonderful results with any type of guidance appliance. It's not really about the appliance itself. It's about the redirection of the breathing and the musculature. So an appliance alone maybe doesn't do the whole thing, but when you get involved with nasal hygiene, friend and release, myofunctional therapy, of course, fixed expanders, pre-guidance appliance for those kids who are really tiny. If you have a nice routine around the guidance appliance, you can do wonders with those. 
Um, if you're trying guidance appliance alone on every single kid, you'll see an amount of improvement, that's for sure. But a number of kids need fixed expanders prior to the guidance appliance. The good news is they'll, they'll all work well for you. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, question about the first case that you showed with the beautiful nine-year-old girl. Did you use any mandibular advancement like a twin block? No. So I do not use twin block. I don't use herps. I don't use any other types of appliances. So fixed expanders first. The minimum is always eight millimeters. Both arches are being done. When you develop at least eight millimeters wider and that maxilla is growing beautifully, the mandible will be freed from its trap position. So I don't use any type of mandibular advancement type of things. But what we are making sure happens is that if there are frenums to release and there are, and then myofunctional therapy to do, which there is, because children who look like that have soft tissue dysfunction. So you have to correct the musculature if you expect that overjet to go away. Now, if you're not going to address the muscles to help guide you know, that growth and development, then you have to do things like fight with that overjet, which means mandibular advancement or twin blocks or heavy elastics. And when you're fighting to come forward, you're working against the muscles of the face that are trapping everything back and you end up pulling the upper back fair amount. So now you're closing that gap two ways. We don't really want to pull back on a child. So we're trying to make sure everything's going forward. The best thing to do is make sure you recruit the tongue. So recruiting the tongue is really the key to closing the overjet in a forward movement. So expansion, we need really good width. Then we need recruiting the tongue to get that mandible to come forward for us. Fantastic. And then a couple of questions that are somewhat the same. So I'm going to just lump them together. Sure. Um, waiting for the frenum release and the myofunctional therapy until after the brace, uh, braces and expansion. Why can't it be done during active expansion? And Yeah, you know, there's, there's no bad time to do frenum release and myofunctional therapy. Um, I tend to hold it until after I take the expanders out. You know, when the expanders are in, when you have an upper and lower expander, it kind of limits the tongue being able to taut and behave appropriately. Number one. Number two, if I'm putting expanders in a child, there isn't room for the tongue in the first place. And so I like to develop a lot of significant width and then get them out of the way so that the frenum release and the myofunctional therapy have a big chamber to work within. And so I like to get the expanders in and then out in an amount of time, which, you know, expanders in kids usually somewhere between six and nine months. If they're 16, it's going to go longer because 16, I got to go a little slower. I have to use two rounds for a nice young lady like that one. And so I could be 10, 12 months getting the jaws out where I need to be. So the myofunctional therapy might be a little delayed. Um, the good news is there's no wrong time, but I have a preference. My preference is let me get the fixed expanders in, develop the big width, then turn the child right over to the myofunctional therapy to get the frenum releases and the myofunctional therapy coordinated. Because at that point, if I have braces on the outside with big broad arch wires, well, I can maintain a nice shape and I could be doing a little bit of tooth movement, but now the myofunctional therapist has the whole vault ready to go for the tongue. We got a big home to work with. So you could do frenum releases and myofunctional therapy once the expanders are out and then you get your um, brackets and wires to go a little further. The guidance appliances, of course, those are removable. So whichever one you might be using, the child uses it for an hour or two a day and wears it to bed. You have total access for frenum revisions and also myofunctional therapy during that. So the, the only time that I don't like to do the frenum revision is while my fixed expanders are in place, because if you did it, you can't really get the good therapy going with those kind of impeding the full tongue movements and stuff. So if you're going to do it first, you think about, well, if I'm doing the frenum release first, you really want to have a good round of myofunctional therapy after that's done. So then you would want to delay your expander, get your frenum release, do all that good myofunctional therapy, then get your expanders in there. In my world, it's a touch backwards only because, well, then if I put the expander and I'm tripping up the tongue, I'm kind of undoing what they did. They got to go back and do more. You know, in the end, there's no wrong way to do it. In that case, you might do it twice. You might do some myofunctional therapy first, then you get your expander in there, then you got to go do it afterwards. So you catch up later on. As long as you're doing the friend and release and the myofunctional therapy, there's no wrong way to do it. I've fallen into a preference of expansion first, then turn the kids loose to the myofunctional therapy and get that going. Yeah. As a myofunctional therapist, I approve that message. Thank you. Do you ever use removable expanders? 
So yeah, about 18 years ago, I tried a couple of removable expanders on kids and I'm not a fan. So I don't use removable expanders on kids. The, um, the kids who are, are have enough growth and development to go into guidance appliances, I'll do that. I'll throw them in guides because if you're, whether you're using Myobrace or Vivo, so it doesn't matter, but whatever guide you're using, if they qualify for that to be able to do it alone, I don't mind that. But when you're talking about kids who need expansion, to use removable expanders requires a really good amount of compliance. And I didn't see that happening. So, you know, you, I don't want them going to school with it. So if you're not going to go to school with a removable, because that's a whole nother, you know, can of worms right there. If you don't go to school with a removable and you're not dedicated all evening and overnight and weekends, you're, you start advancing or turning and it doesn't fit just right. It can be uncomfortable. They stop wearing it. And then if you lose a little ground, it won't go back in. So there, there wasn't much room. It's not a forgiving appliance. So any tiny bit, even a weekend, if a child took a day off or two days off and they had a little relapse, it doesn't fit very well. And then you're trying to force it in there. You're adjusting acrylic and resin. And I, I lost... I lost um, interest in doing those early on. So having tried a couple of removable short style expanders on children, I realized, oh, it's going to be fixed. And so we use fixed expanders, upper and lower in every child. It's one set most of the time, two sets in some cases where they're really tiny and we get our expansion done and then we graduate from that and move on. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Um, how do you decide? between using a Vivos appliance or a Vivos treatment plan versus a plan like what you've shown this evening? So in the Vivos appliances are, if you're talking about like DNA and mRNA, they're removable. And so as they would be described as a removable appliance, I wouldn't be using those in children. So for adults, those are more appropriate because I don't use, I don't really use fixed expanders in adults up until about 19, then we stop. So 20 and above, if you're talking about adults with removable, well, they should be compliant enough to do something like they're describing a Vivos removable. The Vivos guidance appliances that are for kids who are younger, those are fine because you're asking for an hour or two a day plus overnight, as long as that child isn't an expander candidate. Because if, you, if you're really tiny and you need expanders first, you know, the, a guidance appliance system might not get you all the way there. You might want to use expanders, then go into the guides. If the child isn't crazy narrow, then you might be able to use a guide alone and an hour a day plus overnight can do wonderful things. As long as you're doing nasal hygiene, friend and release myofunctional therapy, you kind of need the whole package. Guide alone, you get a certain amount of improvement. If you really want to see significant changes, do more to the child, get the nose breathing going, get the frenums released, get the myofunctional therapy going. And I'm a big fan of guidance appliances pretty much at any age from three through about 13. Okay. Um, as much as you want to answer for this one, what would your typical fee breakdown for these cases be based on? Is it several fees? Is it one set fee? Sure. We do, when, if we see a child early, whether it's primary or mixed dentition, we call it a phase one. So we have a fee to treat that child. Let's grow the foundation. Let's coordinate your teeth. And then we'll get them into a point where they have their guidance appliance to get to 12. So we're talking about either primary or mixed dentition. That phase covers them until the first 28 teeth are in. Once we have 28 teeth in place, we take a new set of records and we figure out what's part two. What do we need to do final alignment? Do you need a few months in braces or do you need a few months of clear aligners? And then whichever they choose, that's part two has a separate fee. So typically a phase one, an early phase, if, um, we could think about mild to severe as a range because it's not one fee. Some kids come in and have really significant problems and others are more mild. So in a mild to severe range, we might think about anywhere from $4,500 to $7,500 in a phase one. And then the part two, you know, phase two is usually lower only because if you do really well through all that and you do everything you're supposed to, expanders, guides, friend and myofunctional therapy, if all of a sudden you're close, if you needed 17 aligners or 15 aligners or eight months in braces, that's not four or $5,000. So we charge a lower number for the second part. If you don't want to do friend and releases in myofunctional therapy and you don't want to wear a guide, yeah, you might have more to do as a teenager. And maybe then you do have another fee of 4,000 or 5,000 to do, you know, a year or 15 months of clear liners or braces. So you're trying to divide it into two parts. So we do a phase one, phase two. Phase one is somewhere between 45 and 75. Phase two 
it remains to be seen what's left to do. We have a percentage of kids who never get phase two because they'll do everything we ask them to do. They're deep to land where they belong. There is no part two, you're all done. Then there's the majority of the kids who do get, usually it's a 10 to 12 month round of aligners or brackets. And then in that is a fee and it's somewhere between three and five, depending upon you know how well they did with their guide getting them to that point. Fantastic. If they have diagnosed sleep apnea, do you ever combine myobrace with the expanders simultaneously? I do not combine the myobrace with the expanders. So I feel like it's a little too much in there, but I do combine the myobrace with the braces. So the expanders go in and start getting all that. We add the braces in, but then when we remove the expanders, we insert the myobrace. And myobrace does make a nice appliance to go over the brackets and wires and they call it a trainer for braces, the T4B, the B series. They have a line of their guides are, are built with a wider track so that you can have a set of braces on and kind of pop it in. That helps with the nasal breathing, the tongue positioning, the swallowing, the lips. So we like, I like that appliance for right after I get the expanders out of there while we have the braces doing a little more work, we'll give them that. So I do incorporate it then. Okay. As part of your expansion, have you reopened bicuspid extraction sites before? We are doing, we have to do that weekly now. So yeah, the answer is yes, and at any age. So we have the kids who come in at 13 and 14 and they've already had them removed and they show up and they're done. But meanwhile, they have all kinds of symptoms and ridiculous things happening to them. So we go right back in there with expanders and open up those spaces. And then we have the adults who are in their 30s, 40s and 50s who just through sheer growth and development appliances followed by clear aligners, that space reappears because it's natural for it to be behind the canine where the missing tooth is. The back teeth go wider, the front teeth go forward. Next thing you know, you got a big gap in there. And if you're treating the patient until they're asymptomatic, whether it's their breathing or their TMD, uh, you may have a large enough space. So we've had to add either implants and or bonded ceramic teeth to places where there should have been a tooth or once was a tooth. So yeah, that we've done that in every age group now. How do you treat anterior open bites? Any intrusion or extrusion? Anterior open bites. So before there is any intrusion or extrusion going on, we establish a proper width. So cases that show up with an anterior open bite are almost always narrow. So we're getting involved with expanders first. So the foundation is still first. It's not about the teeth until after the foundation is fully sized. So expanders are first and expanders with, if you're adding some brackets and wires to those, you'll get some leveling, but we're not doing full closure of that yet. The next step, once the expanders are removed are frenum releases. Usually in the anterior open bite, there's more than the lingual frenum to do. Sometimes the labials or the buckles have to be done too, but it's right to myofunctional therapy because you want to have that tongue trained appropriately so that if you can have the tongue helping you out, meaning not getting between the teeth, you have an easier time to close it. So I don't like to try to force the teeth closed when the tongue is still trying to live in there or spending a lot of time in there because then you're, you end up using too much force to yank things together while you could just teach the tongue to stay behind the teeth and they'll collapse together nice and easy. So it's expanders first to develop a full width and foundation. Once you have that established, it's, it's friend and release myofunctional therapy. I don't begin to close the open bite until after the tongue is behaving itself appropriately. So I wait for permission, so to speak. The patient has almost graduated, done a lot of myofunctional therapy. Now we're ready. Okay, we'll help guide those together. So that, that's a sequence of events uh, I like a lot. All right. I have a direct follow-up for the uh, opening of the extraction spaces. The expanders that you use are transverse. How are you getting that opening of those spaces if it's not mm -hmm. a AP growth? Sure. So anytime you use uh, lateral expansion, you do get forward growth. And so Dr. McNamara's research showed that beautifully that anytime you put an expander in and you expand laterally, you get the maxilla growing forward as well. Now, anytime teeth are missing, usually if it's an adult, you start noticing spacing showing up anyway, the body wants to kind of relapse back to where it was. What we incorporate in the expansion appliances, you might've seen those anterior finger springs, they're arms that kind of cross over in the front. And so those arms can be activated to nudge forward a little bit. So as we're doing the turning of the expander, that child shows up every week or two and we make a little crimp or adjustment and we activate those arms to put a little pressure on the lingual of the teeth. 
and it starts to nudge forward. And so as it starts to nudge those teeth forward, we start getting some space. The big space comes from when we add the brackets and wires and springs, because we put the brackets and wires on, maybe it's three, four months into the expansion process, and we add little springs between the canine and premolar. So we begin with a spring that is just two millimeters longer than the space available, but every month we grow the spring. And as the spring grows, the space goes. So basically you're getting your full width and it could be a minimum of eight millimeters up to 10, 12, 15, whatever it is, followed by the bracket and wiring where the springs are in those spaces and because that space was once available for teeth, the body tends to want to go that way. So you get premaxillar growth forward and the self ligating, the kinetic arch wires, um, the nitai kinetic arch wires and springs in between canine and premolar are really what develop that amount of space to give back teeth. Clear aligners, by the way, to do that. We do a fair amount of opening of those spaces with clear aligners alone, but that's again, the adult category. Oh, fantastic. Well, I want to take some time to thank you for answering all these questions. I know we couldn't get to all of the questions, but there were some very fantastic ones that you answered. I think you provided such value today. Thank you for sharing all of those cases. Uh, anything that you feel you have left to, to share? Any well, it was my pleasure. I know it's a short kind of powerful thing. It's more about exposure, like what's out there, what can you do? And I, I'm sure one of the questions might be, uh, how do I learn more about this? And I think you have a couple of slides where people might want to know more about that, because if if I can do it, and you know, I'm, I'm just a big idiot, I'm a lowly GP, and I can do this kind of stuff. You don't have to be a genius to do this. Anybody could do it. And so now that I'm comfortable enough after doing it for 18 years, I've been teaching how to do it. And we do have courses where we teach how to do this, so that the kids that you see that look similar could have the same type of growth and development and have an opportunity for 32 teeth. Absolutely. So everybody who's been on tonight, if you're interested, we would love it if you would join one of the courses. You can learn so much more from Dr. Moralia himself. Um, our next class is actually this Friday, pediatric mini residency. And then the next Friday, we're going to do the adult mini residency. The next course is running in September. You can learn more and register. It's not too late. You can get in. There's probably well, couple of seats left, if even. Then we have our mini residency, TMD to ortho with Dr. Michael Gelb. Dr. Gelb has been treating for over three, almost four decades now. So you'd be learning exactly from him how it is that you can treat the TMD patient as a prequel to airway and ortho. That is happening this month on the 20th. It's 100% virtual, so you don't have to travel anywhere. Feel free to... Um, sign up for that as well. And then we have the, our advanced mini residency. Um, the advanced mini, mini residency is fantastic. You can learn more about fixed expansion and expansion of ortho for teenagers. That's going to be in June, June 3rd and 10th, 100% virtual as well. You don't have to travel for these. Our Airway Health Solutions Myo course, if you do not have Myo in your office, and I don't know how many times if we were playing, you know, any sort of game where we were tallying it, I probably about 10, 20 times tonight, he mentioned Myo. Myo is very important to being able to help you with all those cases. So September 9th and the 23rd, I co-teach that course with Brittany Sierra. She is phenomenal. Um, if you don't have anybody in your practice that you would like to learn for the myofunctional therapy course that we do the two day four, you can always use Brittany's wonderful services. She does telehealth. So all you have to do is contact or send an email over to info at airwayhealthsolutions.com. We'll get you connected with Brittany and her services. That way your patients can get myofunctional therapy no matter where your practice is. And then you can join us in July. We're going to be in Nashville at the Dental Festival for a Airway Health Solutions and Clear Aligner Universal Clear Aligner University conference. You get 20% off the registration. There's 18 different conferences and you can do all 18, including these wonderful two that we'll be doing. So 20% off when you register using the promo code AHS friend. And then the biggest event of the year, you do not want to miss Airway Palooza, okay? This is going to be phenomenal. Savannah, Georgia, December 8th through 10th. Keynote speakers, James Nestor. We've got a 
powerhouse of speakers. Um, it's going to be a, a can't miss event. James Nestor wrote that best-selling book, Breathe. You got to be there. I hope to see you all in Savannah, Georgia, December 8th through 10th. Mark your calendars now, and it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful event. Everybody who has done our mini residencies, patients have been on the website. They do look and they do try to find where people are doing these expansive techniques. You can get listed. You just got to contact us. You take a course and we'll be happy to get you on here as an airway dentist. There are so many of you guys already in the USA and Canada. And so I know somebody in the chat had asked where you can um, get the appliances, what lab that was that Dr. Ben had mentioned. It's Ollendorf Appliance Laboratory. We also do have Airway Health Aligners. So it's our particular brand of clear aligners. Phenomenal work, Doc, um, Ollendorf Labs or Ollendorf Labs do. Phenomenal work. Okay. Um, and the case fees, a lot more information here about the, um, the case fees for the labs. And so you save a lot of time, you'll get great results. I mean, it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, and then you can join our Airway Dentist Facebook group. That is a wonderful place where you can connect with other like-minded professionals. And that's a great place for us to be able to have conversations and ask questions and you can get great answers from like-minded. The Airway Health Meetup Facebook group is also a great place to join as well. Feel free to join these groups, ask questions, and we thank you so very much for joining us. Try to end promptly so that I don't disappoint. Um, wonderful, Lauren. Thank you, Dr. Moralia, for being with us tonight. It's so happy to have had all of you here. Uh, I hope wish you all well. Have a great evening, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Airway Health Solutions conversation series. Thank you very much, Carice, for leading that. I really appreciate it. Everybody have a good night. We'll see you at the next meeting.